Zoological gardens, beyond books, toys, and TV are one of the first and most important places people are introduced to wildlife. Here, people who may never have the chance to reach the remote remaining jungles of Borneo, the Arctic coasts of North America, or the savannas of East Africa, can see an orangutan, a polar bear, or an African elephant. Public outreach, engagement, and education is critical to the mission of modern zoos, as without guests, zoos cannot function and do ex situ conservation work. For this, zoos must be viewed as positive places, and not, as some may put it, prisons. This is where other media can come in to present zoos in a positive light, both through showcasing ex situ conservation and by mirroring educational strategies employed by zoos. Probably the most well-known series of media to do this is Zoo Tycoon. Twenty years ago, the game Zoo Tycoon was released. I remember the first time I was introduced to the game by my cousin, and being an animal-loving child immediately needing to have the game myself. I mean, I used the proceeds from a yard sale selling off Fisher Price playsets and whatnot to buy a complete collection. Pretty soon, the sequel came out, and then I was really hooked. Ultimately, I was quite active in the Zoo Tycoon 2 community for many years between middle school and my first few semesters of university. I spent so much time doing stuff in this game, I guess making a video over analyzing what I learned about conservation from this franchise, along with using the evolution of how XC2 conservation and wildlife education is portrayed in video games, while also comparing it to how a real-world zoo educates visitors on wild animals and their conservation, will hopefully make an interesting and enlightening episode on how to protect wildlife, and maybe help me understand this series' place in my life, or something. Okay, so the year is 1998, and a small video game studio has just been founded, Blue Fang Games. While figuring out what their first game is going to be, they consult on other projects. At this time, the game Roller Coaster Tycoon is under development, and pretty soon the small studio catches wind of this 1999 game, and is enamored with the idea of a business simulator, and began working on concepts for a tycoon game eventually realizing a lot of people like animals, and so Zoo Tycoon began development. So off the team went to the zoo to get an understanding of how a zoo worked. We'll see, it's the zoo. It's on a rainy, rainy day. So there are many people who have issues with zoos. In the US, around half of all adults have not visited a zoo in the last two years, and of those, only 25% were aware of conservation efforts at their local zoo. Combined with this general lack of awareness about the importance of zoos and conservation, in researching my previous video on XC2 conservation, my reading of the history of zoos makes me think the negative view of zoos is largely based on two additional factors. In their several thousand year history, only in the last 40 to 60 years has the modern zoo that focuses on conservation and welfare appeared, and second, based on the American Association of Zoos and Aquariums versus the Department of Agriculture's numbers, only around 10% of zoos are accredited by the AZA and so definitely focus on conservation and welfare, and so even if an additional 10 to 20% of zoos that are not accredited by the AZA strive for best practices, the majority of zoos would still be not that great, and so I can see where some of these people are coming from. When developing Zoo Tycoon, the team wanted to show zoos in their best possible light, with the idea of welfare and XC2 conservation as some of the most important aspects to the modern zoological garden becoming part of the core design philosophy. In Zoo Tycoon, if you click on the Zoopedia, you get several paragraphs of information, including on conservation. There it is. Zoo Tycoon also has conservation research, where you invest money to unlock rare animals, buildings home to small animals, and better plants. In Zoo Tycoon, outside the Zoopedia and the conservation research for the player, the actual educational components you can put in for the guests is mostly limited to exhibit signs. Exhibit signs are a common feature at zoos, with the name of the creature, 
where it occurs naturally, conservation, and some fun facts, though the evidence suggests few visitors actually read them. Ah yes, the noble sign. Nice short information, little species survival plan, endangerment status, range. Very, very small range. Maybe leopards, a lot of, just a lot of text. This is an explanation of a SSP sign. More than 500 species of animals. All your, uh, your tiger timeline. Sign's getting a little old. Explain the difference between big cats and small cats. How do tigers hunt? Zoo Tycoon also has educational staff that basically tell guests about animals, which is a way to engage visitors who may not read signs and get conservation or zoological messages across. Education staff also can convey emotion that a sign simply cannot, and emotional connection is more likely to be remembered than facts, and so is a powerful tool for fostering conservation action. Another way that modern zoos educate guests is by incorporating educational elements into the exhibit design itself. Originally, zoos had simple and easy-to-clean enclosures that Zoo Tycoon from the beginning did not try to replicate, going more for the open, naturalistic enclosures of modern zoos. This is part of the aim to make welfare a very important part of Zoo Tycoon, which in a real zoo is actually a critical part of education. Research suggests guests spend more attention and time at exhibits with animals that are visible and active, and more likely to engage in conversations related to the animals. Well, with the one caveat being if the activity an animal is doing is what is known as a stereotypical behavior, such as big cats pacing back and forth, that will more likely be viewed negatively by guests than a cat just sleeping. With the more modern naturalistic enclosures depicted in Zoo Tycoon being better for the animal's well-being, it makes them more likely to present natural behaviors, not stereotypical ones, and thus increase guest attention. This is why enrichment is so important, but we will talk about that in a few minutes because Zoo Tycoon only has a few enrichment items for some of the more iconic species. Because most zoo visitors do not actually read the signs for the most part, exhibit setup is really important at giving people context clues to educate visitors. Paired with some signage and educational programs, a well-designed exhibit space can improve visitor perceptions, which translates into empathy for the zoo animals, which then translates into empathy for wild animals and their ecosystems. Later in this video, I will be exploring empathy in more depth as we get into the more interactive games in the franchise. So yeah, this exhibit area is all meant to represent like a Nepalese village for all the Asian cats. So this is a, uh, the Amur Tiger um, exhibit. It's a muddy mess right now. Uh, but it's got like a nice stream, it's got a swimming hole for them, some little shelters, um, and then uh, a sky bridge back to their holding. Really nice. And then the, le the, the tiger can kind of see um, uh, cats in the adjacent enclosure. So yeah, this is a pretty well designed uh, Amur Tiger exhibit with tons of things to look at and lots of trees. Zoo Tycoon did very well. At its release, video games were seen as an activity for younger boys, but Zoo Tycoon did well at attracting female gamers and a group of people in their 50s and 60s. Again, everybody loves animals. Part of the charm is that the game allows for a lot of customization, and there is no real right way to play the game. Well, technically there is, because if you don't have good welfare, you lose access to the Animal Adoption tab, because the game's design is to show zoos in a positive light, and so welfare is a critical aspect to this game. In the end, Zoo Tycoon had two main expansions. 
those being marine mania and dinosaur digs, adding aquatic and extinct animals respectively. In October of 2003, Blue Fang would release a free mini-pack called the Endangered Species Theme Pack, which focused on endangered species like sawfish, orangutan, Mexican wolves, and Bigfoot? And the Loch Ness Monster? Actually, mythical creatures and cryptids do have an interesting place in conservation and environmental discussions, but that is a video for another time. Zoo Tycoon would release a few more free downloads through 2004, but at this time Blue Fang was hard at work finishing up the game's sequel. On November 9th, 2004, Zoo Tycoon 2 was released. Leaving the 2D world of Zoo Tycoon and heading into three dimensions, this game added many new features. You the player can actually play as a zookeeper, cleaning dirty exhibits, feeding animals, and administer medicine to sick animals, and otherwise get close to your zoo's inhabitants and get out of the aloof management position. Combined with the ability to build your zoo, however, and with the removal of loss of access to new animals even if you have low welfare, Zoo Tycoon 2 gained an even larger following than its predecessor. Zoo Tycoon 2 does several things over Zoo Tycoon to enhance the conservation education its players receive. First, animals now have a conservation status. Low risk, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, and when they did prehistoric animals, extinct. Which, if you know the IUCN categories, is a simplification with a few endangerment categories missing. When an endangered or critically endangered species is born at your zoo, you get a balloon bouquet to commemorate the event. This system was really my first introduction to conservation status categories outside just endangered species versus not endangered species, and Zoo Tycoon 2 did at least get me familiar with the idea of critically endangered and vulnerable species and some of the nuances there, and while the IUCN statuses are the most widely used, other organizations have their own, like NatureServe or the New Zealand Department of Conservation. So while I think the endangerment statuses in Zoo Tycoon 2 are definitely inspired by the IUCN statuses, it is not completely unprecedented to diverge from them. Zoo Tycoon 2 also introduces the ability to release animals into the wild, as using zoo animals to reinforce wild populations is often touted as one of the main benefits of zoos in society, though actually reintroducing animals is a much more involved process than a helicopter appearing out of thin air and flying off. And at this point, though captive animals from many species have been returned to the wild to reinforce populations, or even return a species that is no longer found in the wild back into the wild, it is still quite rare and more of a potential future benefit over something most zoos actively engage in. Again, Zoo Tycoon is striving to put zoos in the best light, but reintroduction, or the more preferential term translocation, is still a very new field of research, one that I do hope to discuss in detail in the future, especially as it relates to extinct in the wild species. Zoo Tycoon 2 also emphasizes enrichment over its predecessor, with most animals having the ability to interact with enrichment that increases their welfare. Enrichment basically gives animals an opportunity to interact with something that simulates conditions of the wild or encourages them to display natural behaviors and combat stereotypical ones. And so generally, the best enrichment should be goal-oriented to get animals to present a particular behavior. While a tiger may not find a big plastic ball out in the wild, a ball simulates hunting behavior, standing in for a prey item, thus the goal of the ball is to get a captive tiger to display stalking, chasing, and bringing down prey. As said earlier in this video, viewing animals presenting interesting natural behaviors increases visitor interest and promotes empathizing with animals, which in turn leads to caring about the plight of the animal's wild relatives. See all that climbing and all the fire hoses, I guess? Um, and wood kind of replicates side of all the lianas and branches and nonsense and Bornean rainforest. 
We have meerkats and all their little burrows that allow them to sort of replicate their uh, their homes inside of burrows in the Kalahari and a fun little uh, termite mound for them to run up and down. Now clearly giving a, uh, a polar bear a tree represents it fighting a giant squid, I think. I don't know. It does like, this polar bear loves this tree though. It's gonna beat this tree. Just sort of another, I mean, yeah, so a tree can represent a prey item to a, uh, to a bear. You get that tree. You can see that big white barrel in there. And that's to replicate some sort of prey item for the Amur tiger. So you can see with this porcupine, we got lots of climbing and lots of little pieces of wood and stuff that can be shredded and chewed. And here you got porcupines and uh, hornbills. There's a hornbill way up there. And so they got like different things to play with, like the roll of um, fire hose. You got things like papers stuck inside of tubes for them to pull out. So that's just good for like shredding. Oh, there goes another hornbill flying around. Got some fruit bass. This is a nice hanging fruit um, feeding thing for them to grab off of. So let them feed like on they would on hanging fruit in the wild. A bunch of armadillos and a lot of material for them to shred since they're diggers. One more piece of education I wanted to highlight is Zoo Tycoon 2 was the first time I was exposed to the term biome, which I think can be a little misused in video games. They are defined as large areas that share similar communities of organisms due to environmental factors. Organisms don't necessarily have to be the same species, like how moose and brown bears exist in boreal forests in both North America and Europe, but they do have shared characteristics because they live in that biome. For example, water conservation adaptations in desert species, ranging from camels to cactus to kangaroo. They are broader than habitats, and a single biome may contain multiple different habitats, which is probably the better term for different areas on relatively small maps like in Subnautica. A year after Zoo Tycoon 2 was released, the first major expansion came out, 2005's Endangered Species. This expansion added many new animals missing from the original game's roster, especially endangered ones, such as orangutans, scimitar-horned oryx, giant sable antelope, African painted dogs, and the Florida panther, but also some much needed or animals that have quite successfully been conserved, like koala, gray wolves, and American bison. In fact, I was introduced to many of the world's rarest species, like the Spanish lynx, through this addition to the game. This is a benefit in actual zoos as well, where guests can come across animals they have never heard of before and learn about their threats in the wild. This addition to the game also came with its own sets of campaign missions, including three endangered species scenarios, all to win this shiny, snazzy conservation center, which was always a goal of mine to unlock as a kid. But the endangered species zoo challenge is grueling. This conservation center apparently modifies and increases the breeding behavior of endangered species, which I guess I never did have a Florida panther birth in the game, so it is pretty useful. This expansion also added some new features to the base game like elevated paths and vehicle rides. Another new addition would be the conservation area, which are areas found on each of the new endangered species maps and are areas you cannot modify in any significant way such as adding or removing plants, or anything that will change the terrain. These are actually an important addition meant to help educate players on conservation. Habitat destruction is the greatest threat to most endangered species, 
and the conservation areas are meant to remind players that the natural habitat of animals have to be protected as well, and as a bonus, guests donate more money if they see animals in a conservation area of the appropriate biome. Over the next few years, Blue Fang would produce a further three expansions, African Adventure and Marine Mania in 2006, and Extinct Animals in 2007. With the financial success of Zoo Tycoon 2, by 2008 the team began preliminary development on Zoo Tycoon 3, but the company started to move away from PC development, and Zoo Tycoon 3 was scrapped. However, they would create another zoo game called World of Zoo, which was released on the Nintendo Wii and DS, as well as the PC. It, though, was definitely more focused on a younger demographic, and in the end, World of Zoo got little fanfare. It appears a mere four reviews exist of this game on Metacritic, and combined with some financial failures with Facebook game development, Blue Fang closed down. Despite the closure of Blue Fang, Zoo Tycoon 2 had garnered enough of a following that the game would live on through the fans, especially those playing the game heavily modified. Creating new animals had almost always been a big part of the Zoo Tycoon franchise fan community. Blue Fang created an official program called the Animal Project Property Editor for the original Zoo Tycoon with the idea to let you make new animals. While no such official program exists for Zoo Tycoon 2, it took only a few months for people to begin modifying the base game. In the community, modders became known as designers, and mods are generally referred to as downloads. In fact, some of my earliest exposure to YouTube was watching videos made with Zoo Tycoon mods, whether people were hunting Bigfoot, making short ads for their fan-made expansion packs, or just showcasing mods. After a few years of just watching mods, I did get into playing the game Heavily Modified, which as the community was made up of animal fans and biology students, I was introduced to many strange species that are so obscure that I, as an animal nerd myself, had never come across. Eventually, I figured out how to modify the game and spent several years in the community as a designer, making a variety of downloads for the game. Rare species and conservation often worked its way into mods. And, in fact, the only user-made campaign mission is centered around the conservation of the critically endangered Saiga antelope, created in the wake of the 2015 epizoonotic mass die-offs that halved the already struggling herds. Through modding, Zutekun 2 was able to reach out into the wider world of wildlife conservation on the internet. There is a blog post by a conservation biology blogger using a model of a sala made by a Zoo Tycoon 2 designer to talk about the future direction of conserving this unusual mammal, which I find interesting because it was this particular mod that first introduced me to the sala. Perhaps the most interesting and important real-world crossover was when the custom animations of the beautiful thylacine made by one of the most famous Zoo Tycoon 2 designers were put up on the Thylacine Museum, a web resource on the biology and history of this recently extinct species, curated by several of the world's leading scientific experts on the animal. They were not coded into the game, and so only exist on this website, fitting for an extinct species. With its fan base, the Zoo Tycoon brand remained rather valuable in the years following the collapse of Blue Fang. The ownership rights now belong to the game's publisher, Microsoft, which were working on the new Xbox One, and so as part of the big launch they tasked Frontier Developments, who had previously worked on Connectimals for them, to reboot Zoo Tycoon. And the result was mixed, to put it kindly. Gone is the customization that made Zoo Tycoon popular in the first place, as is the freedom to play as you wished, just plop down pre-made exhibits and not mix animals however you want, so no predator-prey interactions, which I understand why they would want to discourage that to keep a really positive light on zoos. The game also baits you by saying it has all these species, but as soon as you realize that there are every possible subspecies of lion and tiger, you see that you have been a little misled. And while I love that I can make a zoo with every different subspecies of giraffe, this did not go over the best with everyone. 
The main draw was the recycled connectimals technology, in the way of minigames where you can feed giraffes, power wash rhinos, or make dumb faces at a bonobo. This is also, in my opinion, the strength of the game. So, if you have seen my breakdown of the game Subnautica, you will know how I feel about using empathy to strengthen conservation messages, and being able to interact with animals directly is a great way to forge connections. Another great addition is ambassador animals, which are used by many zoos to let guests get really close to animals and give them a unique empathetic connection. Finally, the reboot would also bring in animals with actual names, and not just Polar Bear 13. Giving animals actual names is another way to connect with them, and even when you send them to another zoo or release them into the wild, you can look them up and where they have been sent to and get some updates like the animal has joined a herd or flock, which is a fun detail. In real zoos, using empathy is critical for the conservation mission and can be used to elevate the humble sign to a new level. So here's a good sign on, on hunting and uh, how, um, oh my gosh, that's so bad, and how, uh, how little of a chance predators actually have at getting food each night. Okay, it's, it's not oiled well. So this is a nice sign because you can compare yourself to the arm spans of orangutans because they have long arms because uh, they live in trees, being super arboreal. High engagement sign. Look, you can, you weigh 11 pounds. Uh, so that's just so that we are heavier. Well, look, I now weigh as much as a newborn elephant calf. So exciting. Here, you get on here. Oh, we can as much as one week's food for two rhinos at the zoo. That, that is a lot. The Zoo Tycoon reboot also got directly involved in conservation efforts. It was developed in conjunction with the American Association of Zoos and Aquariums, and with the use of a more integrated community available in the Xbox One, they were able to issue official conservation-themed challenges, which, if the community met, would result in a donation to a real-world conservation program. The first was a $10,000 donation to the AZA Sumatran Tiger Species Survival Plan, for the release of 1,000 virtual Sumatran tigers on the Xbox One, which was voted on and won over a similar rhinoceros and Komodo dragon donation competition. Unfortunately, as far as I can tell, it only happened that one time. Despite the rather mixed reception to the game, especially within the Zoo Tycoon fan community, the launch was successful enough that in 2017 a new Zoo Tycoon game was released, Zoo Tycoon Ultimate Collection, which was basically just the previous game, but with added South American and Australian animals. This would be the final release in the franchise. Frontier, though, were not done with zoos. They had created a spiritual successor to Roller Coaster Tycoon called Planet Coaster in 2016, and so in 2019 they released Planet Zoo. I do not want to spend too much time on Planet Zoo because this is a Zoo Tycoon video, and I think it could go down a whole rabbit hole on XC2 breeding programs and how Planet Zoo represents them in the future, so we may revisit it one day. Thus, I want to stick only to the education and empathy elements that we have already been focusing on, because in many ways, Planet Zoo takes these education elements to the next level. Education is very important in this game, with customizable signs on each animal, as well as recorded information and animal talks given by educators, where they enthrall guests with animal facts and even toss food to the animals. These are great guest interactions, which as you recall help convey emotion, which is important to get conservation messages across. Planet Zoo also has conservation signs on a variety of conservation issues, such as deforestation, the amphibian decline crisis, and climate change and gives the player several paragraphs of information on that topic to read if they so choose. The Zoopedia of Planet Zoo is fairly simplified, which though has less information overall, 
The shorter format makes it easier to find the conservation information, so probably is better for educating players, though some endangered species have a noticeable lack of conservation information. Planet Zoo also uses the proper IUCN conservation statuses, and most species also have the global wild population. Like Frontier Zoo Tycoon, all the animals have names, to help build empathy. However, if I were to have one major criticism for Planet Zoo, I feel like this game takes several steps backwards in terms of empathy for animals. While you can get close to cute animals and observe the beautiful animations, Gone are the first-person elements that make you feel as though you are taking care of animals, which I would argue is the strength of the later Zoo Tycoon games. Like the Zoo Tycoon franchise, Planet Zoo is heavily built around welfare, which can be a little tricky to maintain, which is great for keeping the player invested in caring for their animals, which I would imagine does help build some level of empathy. Like Zoo Tycoon 2, Enrichment plays a pretty central role, and takes advantage of the game's more complex building system to allow the building of climbing enrichment for arboreal animals. Planet Zoo also really aims to replicate zoo management, especially in franchise mode, where you can sell animals out of your zoo to another, or release animals from your captive population into the wild, which is a little more complex than Zoo Tycoon's, with certain animals being more valuable to wild populations, but again, this is a topic I want to talk about in a different video, but my guess is these design choices do help you feel like you are actually contributing to conservation, as do the return of community challenges, though Frontier does not seem to be donating funds to actual conservation like Microsoft did with Zoo Tycoon. Okay, so I guess I need to address the pink elephant in the room and ask the important question. Do any of these games actually do anything in terms of increasing awareness and desire to help in conservation efforts? Well, it is complicated and brings up questions about the importance of work by zoos, documentaries, and this very YouTube channel. Currently, there is quite a bit of work by scholars to figure these questions out, and I will be focusing the next part of the discussion on Miller et al. 2020, and I guess it is a bit of a good news, bad news situation. Basically, at this time, you cannot replicate a real experience that a person might get at a zoo or in the wild. Which means, in conservation, we actually do need zoos to educate, forge connections, and inspire people to take conservation action. Which rejects the notion we can just replace zoos with documentaries or some virtual experience that some zoo detractors have suggested. This does mean, however, that any conservation content on a screen is less effective than if it was in person, and was not significantly different than just having an audio recording without any visuals. So forgetting zoo games for a second, where does that leave me as an educator on YouTube? Does what I or any wildlife conservation content creator do matter? Should I just make podcasts and not worry about all that complicated editing and shot composition? This is where it gets complicated because while Miller et al. found significant differences, looking at their graphs there is quite a lot of overlap in the data variability. That means that the work of documentary films, YouTube channels, or yeah, just pure audio is still important and has potential. It's probably just slightly less effective than if it were done in person. That said, I am basing this on a single study using training sessions of a polar bear to measure how many questions viewers could get right how they emotionally reacted to the bear, and if they had conservation intent afterwards. The study did not investigate the long-term effects or different styles of presentation, so there is a lot of work to still do. Several studies previously have worked on understanding the value of wildlife documentaries, which has given mixed results, ranging from, yes, they do increase knowledge, improve attitudes, and even conservation action, at least in the short term, Two, documentaries only really have impact if a person is predisposed to having a connection with nature and wildlife. Which is where we can get back to Zoo Tycoon. Using my personal experience and understanding of the Zoo Tycoon 2 community, it does feel like it was composed of people who already loved animals, and then were more likely to learn and retain information from the game, of which I personally attested to during this video. 
And so, Zhu Tycoon may definitely have been really formative to people predisposed to having a connection with wildlife. But, it also very well could matter in terms of educating the general public on wildlife and conservation biology, or in giving zoos a positive depiction so they can do conservation and educational work. And so it is important how future games represent these things. And forgoing something like empathy does matter. Or maybe it really doesn't. But maybe playing Planet Zoo gets more people to go to real zoos to get that empathetic connection. Actually, the best thing to do is have such a positive experience at a zoo that you get repeat visitors, which has been shown to be the best way to get education and conservation messages across. Anyway, all this research going into producing this video has really interested me in trying more innovation next year in my content to focus on things such as empathy, because I really think it could help me grow as a creator. So what are the new, more innovative ways zoos are sharing conservation messages and affecting change? What seems to be going on is to move beyond one of Zoo Tycoon's main ways of including conservation, the donation box, which maintains its position of importance in Planet Zoo. Research suggests that despite strides in increasing education and empathy to encourage conservation action, guests are left feeling the only thing they can do is donate money. And yes, that is important, but current innovation is trying to find more novel ways to capitalize on this desire for conservation action. Finding ways to give visitors a way to put that desire into action at the zoo is one such innovation. One method is to give part of the guest's admission to a specific conservation program, letting the guests choose what program they wish to give to, which is a slightly modified version of the simple donation box. Another action is to have sustainably sourced products available in the gift shop, the proceeds of which go to conservation. Planet Zoo sells guests balloons, which is a terrible thing to sell at a zoo because a popped balloon could easily end up being ingested by an animal or pollute the surrounding environment. So right there is a place to grow for that game in particular. Zoos can also give simple opportunities to guests that make a difference. For example, basically all electronics contain tantalum capacitors, which are refined from a mineral known as coltan, which is mostly sourced in Central Africa, and has become an existential threat to gorillas and other rainforest fauna of the Congo Basin, as well as driving many armed conflicts in the region. So a zoo could basically have a program set up to take people's old electronics and properly recycle them, so this precious metal doesn't end up in the dump or unused in some drawer, so less of it has to be mined out of Africa. Another innovative way to make a difference is to provide guests with conservation materials they can take to give them important information. The research on what is the best kind of material to try and get guests to take is that which most connects to their daily lives. Perhaps the most well-known example of this is Seafood Watch, developed by the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which I brought up in my overexploitation video. Basically, it lists what seafood is good, okay on occasion, or something you should never buy in order to protect fish stocks and avoid ecosystem collapses. Providing such conservation material has the potential to change the long-term behavior of visitors. There are even more innovative things now being tried, including outreach into schools, using an endangered species to connect children from halfway around the world on a common conservation goal, which also gives children the opportunity to connect with and empathize with those from a different culture and help undo the centuries of harm caused by colonialism. Zoos often also hold events which can be used to raise money and awareness as well. Perhaps Planet Zoo's future development could reflect some of this innovation, or perhaps that will be what the next zoo management game could do to set itself apart and continue to show zoos in the most positive and innovative light. In the end, Zoo Tycoon and the several other zoo games that have come out over the past 20 years, while definitely inspiring conservation action in a person like me, may have more indirect benefits for conservation by maybe getting people to think about going to the zoo after seeing zoos depicted at their best, and giving some education on how to perceive things like enrichment and conservation breeding. The main criticism I have is how they depict zoos can be a little unrealistic.
Unlike zoo tycoon, many zoos have long histories that extend before the shift to large, open, naturalistic enclosures, and so have to renovate many outdated exhibits which takes time and money to do so. So while a particular zoo may have several new and modern enclosures, there may also be some exhibits built decades ago that do not live up to today's standards. And so it could be a bit of a shock if you view zoos only through the lens of these games. From my reading, the best way zoos can turn a potentially negative experience like this around is to educate guests on what is being done about it. This is the same for stereotypical behavior. As data suggests, explaining how a zoo is trying to mitigate such a behavior can get visitors to leave with a more positive outlook. Well, I feel as though I have sufficiently explored Zoo Tycoon and how it portrays zoos, how they educate guests, and help inspire conservation action, then somehow tying it into how I, as a wildlife conservation educator on the internet, could potentially be more innovative and effective. I guess that will have to be my goal for next year. Thank you so much for stopping by. I would say this is a bit different than my usual content, but at this point I have done three videos on conservation in video games, and have alluded to doing more. So yeah, if you like this, maybe give some suggestions for future directions I can take a look at conservation through media. Please don't forget to subscribe and go take a look at some of my other content, whether breaking down some other pieces of media or filming wildlife out in the rainforest.